Okay, I'm Shauna Shane, and this is going to be a video of a pastel taken from a watercolor underpainting into the pastel into a finish. And the first thing I have to do is kind of mark out where I'm going to be looking. I kind of, I look at the whole thing as a, a lasso around where things are. So if I want to put it, how big where on the on the page uh, I'm going to be just doing part of this uh, because it's a quick demo demo and so I'll start with marking out where the top of my object might be uh, the left side of the chicken itself maybe the bottom where I want the bottom to be and then over here here I'm going to actually measure a little bit how high, how wide, I'm pretty sure it's a little tiny bit taller. There it is, wide, yep. A little bit taller than it is wide, so that's gonna work out okay. And now I start looking at negative shapes. So if I'm going to uh, talk about this shape here, it's gonna be, oh, and the other thing I think about right away is straight lines connected by curves. Straight line, what the angle is, what that direction is curve and then another straight line that's not quite vertical but almost and then I'm looking at the shape right here and it's a really kind of a squarish U shape and now I'll put that shape in as a completed shape this dark shape um, if I fill that in because it's not a watercolor it's a pastel so I can fill in my shapes because once I fill this in I can actually compare this shape to that shape. It really helps me to go as I proceed to go along and see each shape. This one kind of comes this way. Again, even where it looks really curvy, I try to break it into straight lines, direction, length, straight lines, a little space in here. Okay, so now we have another shape right here that helps me and I'm going to ignore what's happening here because that's just an upside down bird feeder that happens to be in the way. And so now I'm going to see if I can come at this from another side. This is all interior shapes, which is really good. But right now I'm going to come back up here and say, okay, if this is where I was here, then I kind of go straight down, down like that. A little tiny U shape underneath. A straight horizontal beak. Lots of times the bird beaks go on the bottom pretty flat. I notice that most students give it a curve on top and bottom, but I've noticed that most bird beaks are flat on the bottom. A straight line that way, straight line this way, straight line this way, see it? Straight line that, straight line that, straight line that. Shorter, a little bit longer, almost the same, almost the same. One, two, and three. And then another little U shape. So now we're, I'm gonna break this into the middle so I can compare and see if my um, widths are correct. It's really easy to get an outside edge incorrect. So if I break it into more shapes in the middle, real light here because that's going to be a, an, an uneven and variated, variegated shape. So I, I want to kind of keep anything that's um, got a changing edge. I want to keep that a light mark. I would never do this. I would never do that because that puts that edge in stone and it doesn't help me at all. So now as I'm coming through here, I'm noticing that edge right there that's way too short, too thin. So that gives me a dilemma. I'm either too far down here or I'm not far enough here. And I'm going to suspect that I'm going to go ahead and, um, well, look at there, I missed that entirely. So we're going to do this, come back out here with the beak. It's funny, when I watch these and put a voiceover later, I see all my mistakes. 
and I realize that anybody watching me notices mistakes as I go. It must drive you nuts. But um, I have heard a quote that I often talk about in my classes, and that's that uh, any painting is a series of corrections. Okay, out, out, a little bit more out from vertical, a little bit back in, a little bit back in. So now we've just brought this down quite a bit. So that means this can come over here. And again, same uneven, delicate lead edge. And I still might come up a little bit higher on this one. Okay, that's that makes me a little bit more happy. And now we're gonna do this big triangle. That's this triangle ending in this point. What's the shape of that point? That's I just break things into different shapes. I don't try to see the chicken at all. It's like if I see the chicken, I'm seeing something that I have in my mind that says, here's a chicken symbol. And I don't want to do that. I want to keep squinting my eyes, see dark and light, and see how what the shape is, what the what the silhouette behind it is, what the negative shape is, and then if I have all of these shapes correct, it will be correct. I don't even, I often say, and I really believe, I don't need to know what it is. I just need to transcribe the shape correctly. And the best way to do that is to not even have any in your idea, in your mind what it is. As soon as you identify it, call it a name, your brain goes into memory and it has a bunch of stuff it already thinks it knows and that's how we get the same symbols for the same things over and over. Okay, so now that looks pretty good to me, but now I'm gonna prove myself by doing some of the outside shapes. First of all, I will do this. That's a nice straight line, isn't it? Straight edge, how far? Now I'm looking how far, what's the shape from that to what's left when I describe the dark part and do the describing the dark part, not even thinking about what's what I've already put. See my outside line? That's now wrong. So I'm gonna have to go, I'm gonna stay with this, but then I have to do this. So this part right here is light and that puts the red part a little bit higher. And I've proved that by saying, if this is a straight line up here, that leaves this dark part right in here, really dark. Red part, this leaves this little white part right there. Can't, can't go without that. That means that the, I just had to raise that up a little bit. Much, uh, just a little proof. And it's, you can, you can say by comparing a shape and an edge from the outside, so that we have that little space, a little space goes up, comes down, goes back up, comes down. Now, if I put that as a plumb line down, I'm gonna be here. If I put that as a plumb line down, I'm gonna be there. I don't mind that one bit, so now I can come do this shape here and come out a little bit more, and there we go. So now we have where I put this pot before. Now we have a little tiny dark space there. A leaf coming here, touching that edge. Another little space here. And it comes on to be like that. And then here we go over here. And now we can say that's gonna be coming like that. And I'm not gonna put that in stone because it's easier to catch that by doing, here's a shape. And if I do the next shape, what I'm identifying is basically the shapes in between the leaves, which gives me more of an accurate thing than ever just painting grasses or painting um, marks that indicate grasses. That's um, usually incorrect. So and once again, I'm going to ignore this kind of stuff. I don't know what that is, but I'm gonna put another leaf here going to about 
button there, back, jaggedy line, jaggedy line. Now we can break this into another, there's a little shadow shape there, a piece of light, another shadow shape here, a piece of light there, it goes like that. This is really not necessary to get exactly right, but it's, I always do it as a, as a check. I probably won't put these pieces in right here. I'll probably put the grass in, some leaves in, and try to catch what's really happening. This part, what I just did, that's light. The rest of this will be more um, soft and uh, unidentified, but it'll be darker. And then we'll see if I can um, do something there that indicates that there's a horizon line going on right there. And I think I need a shadow, don't I? I'll put in a shadow. I'm squinting my eyes. I'm looking at light kind of pretty much coming from above. And I'm going to indicate perhaps it's coming more from this direction. This seems a little bit lighter. I'm right through here, right through here, definitely. And through here, this seems a little bit lighter than that. So I think I'm going to say it's coming from that direction. So that means if I put a shadow, it's going to be that direction. That's, that's where I'm going to and say that there's like shadow area right in here. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that, but I can, that I can resolve in the future. So now I want to do a couple little um, important, uh, take this out a little bit further, make that shape a little bit higher. This is definitely a dark shape right here. Goes like that. So because it's, I want to know where my dark shapes are against my light shapes. So I'm now describing this is a dark shape and I'm seeing this dark shape that contains all of this. We've got a couple of, that's a little bit lighter. I left that out, but this seems like it's really light inside of that dark shape. However, when I squint, uh, that gets a lot darker. In other words, it's a small shape inside of a bigger opposite value. A small value inside of an opposite value that's a lot larger. That means it's never going to be as light as it looks. The contrast makes it seem lighter. So I think taking this little piece of dark, I can continue on what I'm Headed for, I can continue to, um, let's see, let's do the top of this loop right here. Another a couple of little grass shapes. And to indicate foliage. And I think that might give us a little bit of a, a beginning I'm looking for. Okay, so this part will be a little bit darker. This part will be a little bit darker. A little bit darker in there. Definitely this is darker than that. All of this, of course, darker. I'm not going to put too much red in there because it'll, it'll tint my drawing completely. So it's darker. And this part's a little bit darker also, but not a huge amount. So that's, I'm just trying to think where are my dark shapes? Where are my light shapes? And in doing that, I'm comparing the lightest light to the, in the whole visual field, not just what it's next to, but is, I'd say, this is one of my lightest lights. This is also one of my lightest lights through here, but uh, that's about it. There's nothing else quite that light. This is this is my lightest light here. Second lightest light comes up through here. That's about it. I think I'm going to use my eraser now. 
and erase a couple of places that I have some marks over light because I do want to leave the paper empty where I'm going to keep my lights for this watercolor part. Okay, when I was getting everything ready for my watercolor beginnings, I was erasing a couple of shapes here. And then I noticed that that angle was incorrect. So that's a new angle there, which made this angle where the beak comes straight through. That is a direction that's going like that. That raises up the beak a little bit. Also takes it out a little bit. So that's where I'm going to put that. It comes this way and a little waddle. I probably make that a little bit bigger. This is a often bigger and depending on the breed of the chicken. So no harm, no foul there. And so, and then I'll be doing a proof with running straight through. Where does this end up? How much chest is in front of this angle there? Which chest is in front of that angle right there. It's pretty similar. I'm not going to complain too much. I can adjust it a little bit with the watercolor. And I'm also going to say I think this angle is wrong. So that goes that way. That makes this shape a little bit more that direction. And that puts a little bit more of his back leg into view, which... Um, also makes it look like he's not tipping over backwards. I could also encourage a little bit more tail feathers for just a little bit more drama so I can, it's easy enough to give him a couple more manly rooster tail feathers. Okay, um, sometimes with cloth or things on the line or people's skirts or hair, you might indicate a bit of blowing, a little bit of wind Sometimes atmosphere is not uh, a bad thing in a painting. So, um, you know, that's something you can think about that's a real easy adjustment. So mostly now I'm just saying, how does this look? This is certainly going to be a problem, this halo right through here and around. So I will certainly change that by making that into a couple of different shapes, a couple of different values. And um, that's about all I think I have to do before I start putting watercolor on as an underpainting. The reason for an underpainting is so that I don't have to put quite as much pastel on. And also, I can get my darks established. It's really hard to keep going from something as light as this paper, uh, which happens to be a, a sanded neutral colored paper, a, a buff colored sanded paper with a pretty um, a pretty good grit on it but from this color to the darks that you see there which are even a 10 if, if zero is blank and 10 is black we've got some tens in the darks so to take pastel from this color to dark takes a lot of layering and a lot of um, pushing the pastel into the paper. So sometimes that makes it so you can't add any more pastel. And then you have to start using a workable fixative and trying to make the surface allow more layers. And it gets kind of difficult. So an underpainting is one way to establish your darks without establishing, without filling any of the tooth of the paper. So that's what we're going to do now and um, I'm going to start by putting in my lighter lights, uh, just toning it a little bit to the value. And what I did first was I put my lighter colors in the, in the watercolor. My lighter colors I put down on my palette so that I don't have to put dark colors into my light wells. It's, that makes everything pretty dirty. So in order to keep things a little bit more clean, I'm just going to use the colors that I have here for a really light, light, light beige. So here, this is safe. I can see how that is going to look. That might be certainly 
could be a little bit darker than that. So, and uh, watercolor has a tendency to lighten as it dries. Acrylic has a tendency to darken. Things you need to kind of find out about things as, as you learn what mediums do. But none of this is just milk white except for a couple of places. So I'm gonna put a tone almost everywhere. And now I don't have to worry here about where to stop because anything down here is darker. So with watercolor, that goes right over the top. So I do not have to worry about where my edge stops. That's a nice little bonus about watercolor is you can, um, anything that's got a warm tone underneath it could be over here, could be over there. We don't care. We can uh, take this anywhere that we might have a warm. So I'm going to put a little bit of warm down in here, just giving my, myself an idea of that that's going to be covered with some warm uh, earth. Probably it'll go into purple later, but anyway, right now. And what else? We can go into the orange earthy pot shape, which is right here. Let's see, that goes above so it starts there and goes around that leaf and kind of comes around some of the and it goes further here but that gets darker so this is all going to be darker but it still starts with being red okay and then it'll go here and certainly down in this area. Okay. Now let's see what we would do next. I would get probably the feeling of the dark around the face. So it's a smaller shape, but nonetheless, it's an important shape. So I'm going to just put dark here with a little bit of blue point. I guess I have a little bit of a prejudice against using too much brown. So if I have a, what looks like to um, most eyes as a brown shape, I'm gonna probably try to make it into a, a bluish brown shape or a light blue brown shape or a reddish brown shape. I'm gonna knock that value into something that is a little bit more um, beautiful than just brown and try to see in terms of cool and warm. Light and dark, cool and warm. So this goes to be a little bit darker area here. This will be darker here that when it dries and I can put it in without it running too much. I'm on a very vertical surface. Part of the way I handle watercolor is to be quite liquid in my brush. And then on dry paper, I consider it moving a puddle around. Um, so if I'm, if I have quite a bit of liquid to give myself that little bead right there. If I have that bead, then I can move that around. I can bring it up. I can change any little specific silhouette. And as long as I don't just get completely crazy with how much water is on my brush, I can um, take my time, run this puddle where it needs to go. And anything inside that puddle can be dropped in with more color. It can be blended, it can be erased out. It's got lots of possibilities. So just because I love watercolor to be full of um, energy and mixes and wonderful possibilities I like to be able to, let's 
not gonna bother me right there. I don't chase all my runs. It's like I, I look at it and say, is that gonna be a problem? Because of course we're gonna be doing stuff over the top. And uh, this is gonna be a shadowy dirt down in here. So no, I don't have to chase that one. Anything that drips is like, eh, it's not gonna probably be too important unless it really goes a dark area through a light area. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of a warm, a little bit of warm, a little bit of cool in the same brush and just say, this is still damp enough to run a little bit. So get some of the edges I'm seeing. I'm not just doing this arbitrarily. I'm trying really hard to see there's a shape. Here's a shape coming up. This is all a little bit darker here, a little bit darker here. I'm squinting my eyes so I can see as much as possible what the actual silhouette is, where the darks are. Most of the top is darker. So let's put, make that happen. I um, pretend I'm Picard and I say, when I see something, I say, make it so. As soon as I see it, don't think about, we'll do it later. If I see something that needs to be darkened, it needs to be done right now so that you can keep your values going correctly. If you wait, the, the values are not showing as being correct. So here's a good example. We're going to remember that I said that this little spot right here, it's light is not as light as it seemed. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to prove that point in just a minute as I do some darker shapes here, brings it up like that. You see, I'm, I think a lot of times we get into like a system or a symbol and we start doing something repeated. I'm continually observing what the shape of the dark is as close as I can possibly get it. I'm not um, doing a shortcut so much as just trying to build what I see. So this is going to lighten up quite a bit. We've got a nice dark thing that has to come up here. Then that makes a little point. We have a nice another little dark point right there. Then we have another. This is a little bit darker and it'll stay there for a minute now because it's drier underneath. And um, continue that. I'll, I can go ahead and darken this part a little bit here. And this part can be darker too, this shape here. And now I can darken some things while this dries. And you can see it's already lighter. I can go ahead and uh, darken what's behind it. Get some of the major darks established. That's a darkish red. Add a little bit more water and bring it in to that point. Now I add some more of the red shape of the pot. And so that makes a more transitional blend. Now we'll go into yellow ochre a little bit so that I can get a little bit lighter and say to myself, that's probably not any lighter than say a seven at the very lightest part of that pot. So don't want to make it too light. Got a couple areas in here that will do that. Okay. Now, I guess I have some warm on my brush so I can go right into perhaps the red of the comb of the bird. Let's do that. Kind of an orangey red. I rely on the drawing somewhat. But if I see the shape changing at this point, I go with what I see now. Every shape is independent. A lot of times I do adjust things quite a bit because I have new information, so I'm not tied down to anything I've said before. This is all. Okay, 
and that's a small shape and I normally am going to leave that till a little bit later but I need that edge to do the dark back in here. Let that set though because I don't want dark running into the red at that point. So now let's go into some greens. Greens and darks. Dark greens, really dark greens. And when I really want a dark, I'll just add to every dark color that I have. So let's start with this one. So I have some burnt sienna. I have some blue. I have some green, some um, magenta. And so now a little bit more water, a little bit more ultramarine blue, some Payne's gray, some So that this dark is full of richness and I don't want that to go through there so I am going to take that up right there. Just by drying it, it usually will stop it even though I want a completely vertical surface. I'll bring this up and put it next to the bird. A little bit more up here. What I'm doing now is leaving a little space so I can fill that in later, but right now um, I don't want that to contaminate that too much. This is a dark going into a dark, a dark going into a dark, so that's okay. So this one can smear if I want that, that red can actually smear. I'll even encourage that a little bit to kind of come out. Now we'll do some blue right in here. I don't know what this is, but we'll, it's a little bit lighter in value and I don't think it hurts, so I'm gonna indicate that. Actually, a little bit blue into the top part of the beak. Blue into blue. I love darks going into darks colors going into colors. If you lose your edge certain places, it's like it gives you a variety of edge. Now you see it, now you don't. A hard edge, a soft edge, a disappearing edge, a blurred edge. Every variety gives something to enjoy, a surface to discover. What, after all, do we like about paintings? We like to continue to look at them and find new things that we love. A good painting, I believe, you can look at it for the rest of your life and see new things, understand a little bit more, relate to it in a different way. It's not just one, what do they call it, a one-of. It's like you, you absolutely and get a new experience with every viewing. I love that. And that means it has some substance, it has some intrigue, it has some comp complexity. That's a good thing. Notice how light this is. That has just gone away. It's almost not there. And that gives me a chance to uh, talk about this area right here where I said the darks are going to reveal the light of that little piece. So if I make the darker darks much darker than I did in the first place, then that those lighter areas will 
pop and look very light because they're surrounded by a value much darker. So now And I see this little piece looking pretty light and that's the idea. It's not what how dark it is, it's what it's next to. The value is so much more about relationships more than the actual number itself. The number can be a six or seven and next to a ten it will look very light. I'm going a little bit more definite because these are light, this is lightning. The values are going lighter even more than they do on regular watercolor paper. So I have to kind of keep that into consideration, darken a little bit more than I normally do. Okay, now let's see if I can get some nice green shapes here, starting with this right here. Being a little bit up outside the, uh, the edge because I don't want it to be smaller. I want to make sure that that rooster is, is massive in the neck. A little bit over down in here, a little bit. Let's do some definite shadow. If I want that to go back, I have to say that whole area, this whole area is darker. So let's put it that way. And then we have another darker area here. Now I'll brush my brush and get the rest of it a little bit lighter. Is darker going a little bit later a little bit darker but right now I need that to set so I'll leave it alone now I can go ahead and put some more dark dark all kinds of color dark into this area right here little bit of not quite this part is quite dark but not quite as dark as just a little bit of lighter on my I just added some yellow here so it goes to be a brighter green a little bit of blue here a little bit of cerulean blue so this is more of a bluish green I don't believe they're ever going to exactly match colors. There's so many colors out there that are I can recognize and are but we're limited to how much paint can describe. So the idea that everything should match exactly is is a goal that I don't think is achievable, so I don't worry too much about it. I think instead I'm looking for um, beautiful marks, beautiful expression, warm and cool. If I can get the, the value, how light, how dark, how 
how warm, how cool. That's going to be enough. It's not going to match exactly, but I will have the shapes correct. Get some variation back in here. Now I should be able to come with a drier brush a little bit closer in here. So I guess if I had to describe what I'm headed for is to um, give myself about 90% of this painting described in watercolor what I want. Um, that way all my problems are solved. I don't want to solve problems with the pastel stage. I want I want to know what I need to do and have it done here. This is the planning stage. This is the uh, lock-in stage. So if I come across a, a problem that I say, okay, that needs to be lighter across that shoulder right there. I want that to show now and not have to continue to evaluate and reconfigure everything in that next stage. This should be where it's done in my opinion. All my, I have evaluated what's going to give me problems. I've given it some consideration and I've seen to what I need to do. And I have the plan here. I don't want to wait and continue to solve problems in the pastel area. That should just be a joyous adding color and vibrancy and probably some clarification. But more than once, I have decided that this, uh, this pastel stands perfectly fine on its own. I mean the watercolor, and so I've left it just as it is. Um, I don't always change everything to a, a pastel. Once in a while I say, this, this stands on its own. I think we're done. But today we're going to end up with a pastel. Sanded paper is very, very um, easy to work on. It's You can actually race through it if you need to. But also, um, you'd be surprised. Watercolor is one of my favorite mediums because it's much more versatile than people give it credit for. I can put light colors over dark colors if, if I have the right amount of moisture in my brush. I started with watercolor, so to me it was my easiest medium. Everything else was more difficult because it was different. And I have learned since that it's not what other people think are the easy ones. The easy mediums are the ones you began with. The hard ones are the ones you tried to learn later. Now that doesn't matter because that's going to be all dark, really dark, so not a problem, not, not worth trying to overwork and chase because the more marks I make, the less freshness I have. I want fresh, I want fewer marks, not more. So if I, um, if I can say what I need to say a little bit more simply, and without grinding the paper down to what I consider to be toilet paper, it 
it's all smushed together and doesn't have any any ability to be bright anymore. It gets all soggy and lifeless. So your paper should never end up like that. And that's why you don't want to uh, continue to brush and brush and work and work um, when something can be done in one layer later by waiting a little bit. Now let's see, I'll put a, another little piece of lighter pot over. That's a leaf that comes down. However, right here, it's more pot. So that's a case of going right over the top of the dark with something light. I'll do it here too. Put light right over the dark. It's a little thicker. I can do it that way with watercolor, no problem. Now going into the le green leaf, I'll just bring that down a little bit. And then add a little bit of darkish red for the underneath the edge. That And then we'll end up going into the dark, dark again over here. Dark, dark. And that extraordinary deep dark. Then we'll define a couple more leaves over here. So the rules say that a pastel is a pastel, no matter what the underpaint. You can underpaint in acrylic. You can underpaint with a finished drawing. You can underpaint with even a thin oil. Or you can stay with a pastel, one of which can be underpainting with a diluted pastel um, dissolved in a solvent of alcohol or mineral spirits. So there are different ways to put in a block in of a, water, of a pastel. If it's 85% covered with pastel, it is a pastel no matter what happened underneath. Oil paintings 
begin with charcoal drawings. That does not make them mixed medium. And so the same with any underpainting of any medium. If you get 85% covered, it's not mixed. It's the actual main medium takes precedence. So you don't have to worry about how you begin your painting. It's only how you end that matters. What's your main medium? I think I would have to change the category if I added any paper, any collage to this, and that does change things. But underpaintings do not. bit of warmth by it. this area and then I have to figure out again a little bit more of the lavender to go over here a little bit more and then maybe a little bit of that shadow that I was talking about And that, I believe, is all I need to do in this underpainting. And we'll see how that works. Now, I'm going to encourage a few more drips here because um, sometimes I, I frame this so that I leave some of those drips showing. Sometimes I don't, but if it looks good, I'll leave it. That decision can be made later. So now I'm pretty much ready to start with the pastel. If this were a watercolor, I'd be cleaning this edge up by erasing. I don't need to do that because again, the pastel can go right over. But just to show you what's possible in watercolor, I'll just erase a little bit right here. So and get a smoother edge. I can also erase a little bit right here and get a lighter. So any any time it gets a little bit too dark, so easy to erase, but that's where the pastel comes in. Anything that needs to be lighter can easily be added with the lighter pastel. Not a problem. Now I've got a little bit of a lighter blue right here. kind of remind myself that that's going to be definitely a bluish lavender in there. Yeah. And diluted a little bit more of that right in here. out his chest just a little bit more. Okay, there we have it. I think we've got ourselves an underpainting. 